and welcome back to Sharks Happen. My name is Hal. I'm your host, going over shark attacks from the 1900s till present, mostly large sharks, and we're going to get started over in Hawaii. Uh, we're going to go to Kaianapali Beach Park, which is in Maui, Hawaii. The date is May 25th, 2019. Thomas Smiley is 65 years old, and he goes out for a morning swim. He is about 60 yards off the shore, and it's about 9 o'clock in the morning, and he is pulled underwater suddenly. Uh, rescuers quickly get out, and they get on their jet skis, get out to him, and pull him up on the jet ski and bring him in. By the tem time they get him into the beach, they get him off of the get him off the jet ski and onto the beach to do CPR. There was a couple witness there, and she had said that um, she had seen blood on his stomach. She had seen that his left hand... Uh, the wrist, the skin was basically ripped off of the left wrist, so I'm thinking that's defensive. And then the left leg was missing, uh, the knee down, the left leg was gone, and there was no blood coming from the knee. So uh, she had noticed that the only blood she had seen basically was lying on his stomach. Um, so it sounds like a, a defensive wound to the hand, and it took off his leg, and maybe that blood was from his hand that's on his stomach is what I'm thinking. Um, his wife was in the third floor of their condo that they were staying at, and she had heard him scream for help after the first hit. And uh, she went out to the window and was able to see the people go out there to rescue him. She said there's nothing she could do for him. She was up there, and she ended up watching the whole thing. He, he ends up... Uh, being survived by his wife, three kids, and six grandchildren. Uh, bad situation, you know, you did touch that water, that's your ticket. That's the lottery ticket. I always used to call shark attacks a reverse lottery, especially large shark attacks. Uh, you're punching a ticket. You know, you get your lottery ticket once you touch that water, and until you're out of that water, your ticket is still active. So uh, are you going to be one of the two people worldwide that are bitten in that week? You never know. And is that going to end up being one of those small dogfish sharks where you go in and get some stitches? Or is that going to be a large shark, which we cover, which we know that can be completely devastating just with one bite, just because of the size of the sharks? Uh, so that's our story of Thomas Smiley. He is 65 years old. We're going to put it down as an attack and not an attempt to predate. Okay, now we're going to head over off of Garden Island Naval Base, which is Western Australia. The date, October 30th, 2010. Elise Frankcom is 19 years old, and she is out, and she is leading a Swim with the Dolphins tour. And it's about 12.30 in the afternoon. I don't know how far from the beach or how deep a water, but she is bitten by a shark. Now, the shark had brushed a, a pretty large man. Uh, his name is Trevor Burns. It, it actually bumped him as it went and bit her. So they're right by each other, and he instinctively grabbed onto the tail. Now, the shark still got a lease. He's got it by the tail, and the shark is thrashing, trying to get him off of him, and still biting on a lease. And it says that a lease went ahead and punched the shark in the snout. And between the two, the punch and the guy on his tail, the shark let go and broke it, broke free and took off. Um, she sunk now to the bottom of the water. She was not doing well. He, uh, Trevor Burns grabbed onto her and pulled her up out of the water and brought her into shore. Uh, they were able to give CPR to her there uh, to probably put a tourniquet on her leg. It's a bite to the lower leg uh, that involves the knee and... Uh, she ends up surviving six and a half hours of surgery, um, 200, over 200 stitches. I'm going to post a link to the attack. There's a, actually a video of them pulling her up onto the support boat that they take the divers out there in. They're pulling her up onto the boat. It's not graphic. You can't see her leg. You can see a lot of blood. You can see blood both in the water and blood on the on the dive step that you get into the water from. So uh, there's blood in there, and then there will be a photograph of the wound on her leg and she goes ahead and explains the ordeal herself in an interview in that clip so it's a very interesting clip to watch i hope you do and that's our attack on elise we're going to call it an attack not an attempt to predate and we're going to move on okay now we're going to head over to a spot called turtle bogue which is costa rica the date september 12th 1919 uh, there's a fishing vessel out trying to cross the bar, they call it, which is off the mouth of the Colorado River where it meets the ocean there in Costa Rica, Turtle Bogue. And uh, it's very rough waters. The, they can't go ahead and bring a ship in and go ahead and uh, land right on land there because it's all rocky. The surface, too, it'll break up their boat. So they stay off the shore, but they're trying to make their way across the bar uh, when it sounds like they got 
hit into some rocks and then foundered, which is pounded into bits by wave after wave. That's called foundering. It's when you get pounded by the waves in the surf. So uh, they, they get pounded and, and uh, they decide they're going to all launch a skiff. And 13 of them get into the skiff. Uh, too many men for the skiff. There's some gentleman named Borden who's on the, on the uh, rocks on the beach. Well, he's on land in that area watching this ship out there having this difficulties and then he sees the men get into the boat and they're starting to make their way in. It, it capsizes quickly due to the rough surf and, and probably tides and everything else going on out there. Six of the men drown right away. So six out of 13, they go under and they drown, don't know how to swim. The other seven make their way to shore. Uh, just before they get to shore, Mr. Borden says that uh, he could hear the screams and he could see the sharks lifting the men clear out of the water. So they're being attacked by multiple sharks. Screams, he's seeing the blood, he sees the sharks lifting the people out of the water. Um, it's so close to shore, in fact, that they make a chain for the last person that gets attacked by the shark. They make a chain from shore and they're almost to him when he's taken by sharks. So one person out of that group ends up making it out. Uh, six are taken by sharks, six are, you know, six end up drowning. And uh, that's our story of the fishermen over there in Costa Rica. It's just, you know, not many times you can say drowning ain't so bad, but that's one of those cases where those six that ended up drowning, they had a better fate than the six that, you know, didn't make it to shore. Uh, so that's our story. Uh, we're going to put it down as an attack. Uh, six predations by six sharks. We just don't know what kind. Okay, now we're going to head out to Ellis Beach, which is Queensland, Australia. The date is August 18th, 1946. Philip Collin is 30 years old. He is with a large group of people having a picnic party. And at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, about 50 of the guests, including Philip, they, they all go out into the water and for a swim that quickly turns into a game of catch with a tennis ball. So there's about 50 people out in the water playing catch with a tennis ball. Uh, Philip Collins, one of them. Another one is a friend of his, Swinburne is his last name. And they're playing catch, and Swinburne went ahead and threw the ball to Collin, and the ball went over his head and out into the deeper water. So Colin started swimming out to get the ball. Now they're about 40 yards from shore at the most as far as how deep of how far away from shore they are. So the furthest out people are about 40 yards. The ball is thrown about 15 yards past them and Philip starts swimming out to it. Now his buddy Swinburne knows that he's not a good swimmer and he yells out to him, you know, I'll go get that. And he says, no, don't worry about it. He's already almost to it. So Swinburne had swam a little bit of the way out to it and before he was told not to bother and then he just stopped and watched Philip swim out to it. At the same time, there's a, there's a lifeguard that's at the very other end of all these people on the south end of the beach at the other end of the big group and he was watching that swimmer swim out to the ball too and he says what grabbed his attention was how poor a swimmer he was. He said he didn't know if he was going to make it out to the ball or not. But he watched him go out to the ball and just at the last second his, his attention was taken to somewhere else and he heard somebody yell shark. Well, what ended up happening was Philip got to the ball. As he's reaching out for the ball, the shark grabs him. There's a swirl of water, and he disappears under the water. Uh, he's brought up to the surface two times, so they see him up at the surface two more times. So he's attacked three times by this shark. Um, at the time when the lifeguard saw the blood in the water, he swam to the group to get the group out of the water. Uh, his buddy Swinburne started swimming out to him. But he had stopped after he saw the second hit. And nothing could have survived the second hit. And that coach, the, the lifeguard also saw that hit and said nothing would have been able to help his friend then. And after the third hit, the shark disappeared and they never saw him, Philip Collin, again. Uh, Swinburne made his way into shore. It's crazy that he would stay out that long looking for him. He was only 10 yards shy of where the attack ended up taking place. So he's within 30 feet of the attack, had a pretty good sight of what had happened, and his friend just is gone, and we're gonna put that down as an attack and a predation. Okay, now we're gonna finish out our unprovoked attacks over off the coast of Australia. Um, at the Great Australian 
Bite, Smoky Bay, the date May 2nd, 2002. Paul Buckland is 23 years old. He is out doing abalone diving. He is down on a dive and he surfaces yelling, shark, get me out of the water. Um, I don't know if the shark had had him when he came to the top of the water, but the shark got a hold of him and would not let him go. They ended up having to ram the shark with the boat to get him to release Paul. Um, it releases Paul. They pull him up on a dive step. I think he was already gone at this time, bled out for sure. They pulled him up onto the boat. He was missing his leg. He was missing part of his torso by this time. And, uh, you know, he didn't end up making it. He was warned prior by a fisherman that there was a lot of large great whites in the area and he should, you know, be extra cautious when he goes ahead and does his dives. Um, another fisherman, Alan Turner, I believe it is, um, he had said that a shark you know, a 20 foot shark that came up next to his boat, same size shark as just did this attack. And he says he could have reached down and pet it if he wanted to. It, it, so he had gone ahead and asked the South Australian government if they could exempt this shark from protection rules. And he was joined by the South Australian Abalone Divers uh, Union Association. They also asked if they could exempt this shark and they were denied. Uh, the government went, went ahead and said, you know, this protection is for all sharks, you know, all great whites, not just great whites that do not bite people. So uh, the government told them they weren't going to be able to do anything about the shark. I don't, you know, I don't see any reason to do that anyway, uh, unless you have a, a spate of attacks in a tight amount of time. We're talking, you know, a, every couple week, every week or so that you're having an attack in the same area by what looks like the same shark, sure, go ahead and do something. But until that, you know, everybody says that you know, rogue shark is just a stupid theory, a stupid Jaws movie. And, you know, Jaws is just based on a shark that it, it, it I think got lost in a river and what was it going to do and if you look at sharks that are in fresh water like that river is most of their energy is put into trying to stay afloat they have to swim a lot harder to try to stay buoyant so that they don't sink to the bottom of the water um, so people that do research on bull sharks when they get into uh, low low salinity water notice that they are struggling with swimming so much that they probably wouldn't even be able to feed on fish um, being in fresh water there's reasons I think that it doesn't happen so uh, that's our attack on, on Mr. Buckland an attack and an attempt to predate okay we're gonna finish out our show now with our segment you don't hear that every day. And this one's a little tough for me to go over because this is me to a T. Um, as soon as I started reading this, I almost laughed. I uh, lived in Michigan all my life, but my father's always been into going out fishing, being on a boat. And I've always loved to go out on the boat with him, but I have the worst cases of motion sickness, I think, of anybody. And, uh, you know, my drives down to Florida, when I drive down, I drive probably around anywhere from 14, 16 hours. Sometimes the full 22 hours, so I'll drive straight through. But when I end up getting there and I go ahead to go to sleep, my body, as I'm, lay as I'm laying there, it feels like the car is still bouncing up and down. This is how bad my motion sickness is. So they call that wavies when you're out in the ocean and you're in a bunch of waves for hours and you finally get out of the water and it feels like you're still in the waves. That happens to me with a car. So uh, it's kind of funny. This, uh, this story is of Doug Miller. He was out fishing in a 16 foot boat, just a little boat. Uh, they're out on the ocean and he is having a rough time like I always did. Every time I was out on the ocean, I ended up in the same place on the floor of the boat, barely able to function. <laughs> And this is what Doug Miller was doing. He was also on the floor of the boat, barely able to function. And suddenly he's hit. He's hit by something heavy and he don't know what it is. But he goes to get up and the tail of this shark that jumped onto the boat knocks him down. He gets up again and knocks him down again. And he gets up a third time and it knocks him down again. Uh, they finally killed the shark and, and tossed it overboard. It was an eight and a half foot gray nurse that jumped up onto this boat and had him pinned by its tail. Nobody was injured. He was knocked down three times, but luckily he wasn't injured by the shark. But I was not aware a gray nurse could get itself up out of the water. Now, when I think about it, you know, I, I had looked at, because of the tail of a tiger shark, I wanted to see how fast they could go. Um, the tail is nowhere near the, the nice mackerel shark, powerful tail. Um, it's not even 
as powerful looking as a bull shark tail, but they could still do 20 miles an hour in a burst. So pretty much any shark that wants to get up out of the water could do so. All they need is speed and they're going to launch out of the water. So I was surprised to see that, but I'm starting to wonder how many of these fish actually do jump out of the water at times. I have another story we'll go over in the future where one jumps into, guy has his boat moored on the dock and he goes into uh, get lunch, he comes back and there's a shark on his boat, just jumped up on his boat chasing fish. So uh, at more than just the usual suspects of the spinner, the mako and the great white thresher at times can leap out of the water like that. Uh, probably most sharks can do it and probably do do it at times. It's just that some do it much more frequently than others. Um, that's our show for today. I wanted to go over, I wanted to show you, it's been one year. So this is one year since we put out the first, since I put out the first episode of the show. Um, I had a few episodes in there that I ended up getting rid of. A couple of them were shorts. One of them was of, uh, like mistakes, uh, blooper video. And then, uh, so now I got it all settled down, but I wanted to show you this really good cause you didn't have a really good view of it, but I wanted to show you my little my little fin here. Let's turn this light so that we can see this thing. So you can get a good look at the colorations on that. See how the, the ivory, off-white ivory, it goes along the whole outside edge and then it's black in the center. And then the back is just ivory. And you, if I get it good enough, you can see all those little lines in it. So, you know, that's a huge, you know, like I said, you get, you get hit by that thing and you're gonna have some issues. Uh, but we're one year into this, um, you know, I wouldn't even be doing this if it wasn't for the first, I think, 3,400 people. I ended up starting this show um, last year on the 28th of May um, of April was the first show that I did. But the show was came up with about a month before I was in the Keys, just having a conversation around the table. The funny thing is, is that months before, about a month before I went to the Keys, I knew I wanted to do a, a YouTube channel. I had watched, uh, I think it's called Channel Makers is the one that I'd watched. I watched that to learn what I needed to do. Then I had to watch videos to learn how to do videos. Then I had to figure out what I was going to do. Um, somehow this, you know, I've had criticism, complaints that I jump around in time, uh, nothing's in order. Well, that's my H. David Baldrige books. I didn't notice it till I got him. I didn't get the book until months into the show, but that's exactly what it is. He does the same thing. I, I guess I just patterned it after him um, by accident. So I did these four, five episodes, whatever it was. And the last episode is gonna be maybe a day or two before this rescue kitty that we found. Uh, she was clinging to a tree. We, we live off of a side street that's on a five lane highway like street. So it's a busy street. And I was able to hear this kitten crying in the middle of the night with all the cars driving by. And it was across that five lane street and she, there's, there's like fir trees that are right up against the street that line all across there because there's, you know, houses back behind there and there's just a bunch of fir trees. Well, she, we had pinned it down. I had woken up my wife. It was about 1130 or 12 at night. Woke my wife and we went across the street with flashlights and we pinned it down and we found it. She went around and she was the one to find the kitten. And the trunk of the tree had these little spikes sticking on them. They're real sharp too. They stick out about an inch, just over an inch long. And she was clinging to this. She was about chest high clinging to this, to the, to the trunk of the tree crying. So we rescue the kitty, we get the kitty. We love cats. I've done this before, I don't know. I gave maybe three of them away that I got. I, I ha would set up a box and feed the cats at my first house that we had. And uh, I think I got three of our cats or two of the cats we kept, gave two or three away, I think three of them away. So I've rescued about six or seven cats. My wife had rescued one before I even met her. So we're big into rescuing cats. And uh, we got this kitten and it was so young, it didn't know how to drink. They didn't know to lick water. So now we, she had to bottle feed it. We had to 
uh, COVID stuff was going on, so not everything was open as far as your veterinarians. It was tough to get, you know, we like to get them checked out and get everything started right away. We had to wait a month and a half, which just about killed us. So um, most of our time at that point for the next month, so I stopped doing the show. Most of the time was spent with this kitten. Once the kitten was taken care of, then I turned my attention. I had a cabin up north. I had to clean that thing up. I had just bought it six, eight months earlier. I bought it in January of that year before, but I cleaned that thing all up and got it all ready. Did some fishing, which I'll tell you about some of those funny stories. A um, couple of crazy stories when I went fishing, but I did some fishing and I was doing some yard work here. So I figured after Labor Day weekend, I'd get back to it. Well, I never went back to it. I was a realtor. I'm a, I'm a machinist. If you ask me what I do, I'm a machinist. I'm a CNC machine, a G90, G54, G00, X0Y0. That's what I do. I program machines to go over and cut, drill, do whatever they do. Um, did it for 25 years until about 2016. So if you ask me what I do, that's what I do. That's that's my, I guess you'd say, credential. So I'm a machinist. <laughs> but uh, I was doing real estate. In 2016, I was done. I burnt out from tool and die. I was sick of being smelly, oily, dirty, and I just wanted to get out of it. So I switched over, tried to find things to do, ended up in real estate, and I did that for about three years. And then real estate, I didn't have anybody that I knew, you know, in, in a shops all the time, in small shops at that, so you don't know a lot of people. And suddenly I'm working, and when I can talk to people at open houses, I did fine. You know, I, I sold a house that I held open. Uh, couple came through that like talking to me and they wanted me to put the offer in and I did and I got them the house. So I did well with open houses but with COVID that stopped open houses here in Michigan and it pretty much told me that that was the end of my run in real estate. Uh, not that I was doing great anyway, I was doing okay. Uh, pretty much part-time work and pay and uh, then I went ahead and I love to drive so I went ahead and started doing DoorDash and I thought that was excellent because you could just make 20 bucks an hour which is all I needed. Just needed enough money to go up and fish whenever I wanted to and be able to have the flexibility to take blocks of days off when I wanted to go up there and fish. Um, I was out doing my DoorDash and then it was a Friday night I think. I think it was a Friday night and it was rainy and I get a text. It's about 9 o'clock at night and it's my sister. And I look, and she's like, congratulations on your channel. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? And then she texts me back. She says, well, Mikey, which is my nephew, called her, uh, texted her and told her my channel was doing pretty well. And then I looked, and I had you know, tens of thousands of views and, and 3,400 uh, subscribers. I was already ready to go ahead and, and uh, monetize and get going, and I didn't even know anything about it. So. Um, those first 3,400 subscribers are awesome because this would not be going on without that happening uh, the way that it did especially. And ever since then, I just said, screw it. It's time to just do what I want to do now. And this is what I want to do. This is part of what I want to do. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff. Um, I see people worrying about us running out of attacks. We're not going to run out of attacks. I'm trying to rush through these just to catch up just so I can be current. I'm running around here with 1,919 attacks when I should be on 2019 attacks. Um, but we're going to keep, everything's going to go the same way it is. I have hundreds of shows to go, probably three, 400 shows just to get caught up on the attacks that I'm concentrating on now. The thing is, is there's attacks before 1900 of all sizes. There's small shark attacks that we could get into that I might be interested in seeing when they get frenzied up. Um, the regular attacks, I see them all the time. I just blow right by them. As soon as I see any shark, five foot, four foot, I already know it's going to be lash lacerations. That's going to be the injury. Um, so I'm not too into smaller sharks. I never have been. Um, but yeah, 3,400 people, you guys, uh, you guys are the reason for the show, and I appreciate every one of you. And I will be back in a couple more days with another show of attacks. But until then, if you go into that water, you are much more afraid of those sharks than they are of you.